Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and host for the evening, Judge Bianco, um, and then I'll turn the program over to him. So Judge Bianco graduated from Georgetown University and Columbia Law School. Prior to his appointment to the bench, Judge Bianco spent most of his career as a federal prosecutor, first in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan, where he became deputy chief and then chief of the Organized Crime and Terrorism Unit. In that capacity, he worked on many terrorism investigations and prosecutions, including the September 11th attacks. He then worked as a deputy assistant attorney general in the Justice Department in Washington, DC, supervising, among other things, the counterterrorism unit. In 2006, Judge Bianco was appointed to be a district court judge in the Eastern District of New York and was based in Central Islip on Long Island. And in 2019, he was elevated to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, where he continues to serve. Judge Bianco also currently teaches several courses at St. John's Law School, including one on sentencing. So Judge Bianco will introduce the rest of our speakers, but I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy uh, the session tonight. Thanks, Alana, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you and thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, as you know, our topic today is sentencing and our goal is really to take you on a 90, 90 minute journey through federal sentencing law and procedure and policy from five different uh, perspectives. And we've put together an all-star panel um, and we'll give you those various perspectives one by one. We're not gonna be, all be speaking <laughs> at the same time. We're gonna spend about 10 or 15 minutes with each uh, person. Um, and I, I wanna thank all of our panelists for graciously agreeing to be with us today. Um, as Alana mentioned, if you have any questions, I have the chat box up. And although I'm moderating, I'm happy to uh, pose your questions to any of the speakers, and obviously you can ask me questions as well. Our goal is also to, uh, we're recording this, our goal is to make this available, not just to those who are with us today, but to other teachers, so that if you have other teachers who you think might benefit from this program, we will place it on our website when it's done. And we also are hopeful that you uh, might be able to show it to your students uh, as well. So uh, I'll get started from the uh, perspective of a judge, although our last speaker, Judge Gleason, I think can also speak uh, to that perspective among others. But um, I often get this question uh, from a lot of different people, what's the hardest thing that you do as a judge? And judges do a lot of um, hard things and complicated things, but my answer to that question, I think is probably similar to most judges and that would be sentencing by far. It's not even, there's nothing even a close second in terms of the uh, difficulty uh, when it comes to sentencing. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't get really any easier. I, I presided over hundreds of sentencing. I teach sentencing. I review sentencing now in the appellate court. And notwithstanding that, uh, sentencing that I do now are just as hard as the ones that I did at the very beginning. And, and uh, I was thinking about why that is. Why is it so difficult? And, um, I think this is a good place to start. One, uh, one reason is what's at stake. Um, you have a person's freedom in your hands and you feel that weight and that responsibility. And when you're, when you're sentencing someone, I'm in my courtroom uh, right now uh, where I do sentencing, um, when you look out at the, the defendant, um, you see not just him behind him, uh, you'll see often dozens of people, his family, his friends, his neighbors. And as a judge, you are keenly aware. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult sometimes for you to even look up because um, it's, it's just a hard thing. It's a very difficult thing. You realize you're sentencing those people too. You're not just sentencing the defendant. You're sentencing everybody who loves him, who needs him, who depends on him. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the things that makes it a difficult process for all judges. Um, you understand the importance to the community, you understand the importance to the victims, and it can be very intense. It's really, uh, I sometimes describe it as the height of human drama. The only thing that has that same level of intensity is when a jury comes in the room with the verdict that has that similar intensity to it. But often the courtroom is literally divided in half. You have the defendant and his family and friends on one side of the courtroom, all hoping for the most lenient sentence possible. And on the other side of the courtroom is the prosecutor and behind the prosecutor might be victims, victims' families, FBI agents who worked on the case who are hoping in many instances for a much different result. So uh, 
the stakes could not be higher at a sentencing. Uh, the second aspect to it is sentencing is not a science. Um, um, and there are many parts of the law where I feel if you give me enough time uh, with the help of my law clerks, uh, we'll figure out the right answer under the law. We'll do a lot of research and we'll figure it out. Sentencing does not really lend itself to that. It's a, it's a highly discretionary um, uh, process. And we'll discuss that a little bit as we go forward today. And you're trying to measure various factors that involve new, human nature. So for someone like me, who's a perfectionist, <laughs> let's go up with a perfect number. It can be a very challenging uh, process. You're trying, to you're trying to measure remorse. Is the defendant, when he says he's sorry, does he really mean he's sorry? Or is he just saying he's sorry because he wants uh, uh, leniency? You're trying to measure future dangerousness. Does this person pose a danger to society if let them out now? If you think they're dangerous, you have to try to predict when will they not be a danger? How long do they need to be in jail before I believe the community will no longer be a, a, a danger? Um, how much time is enough to reflect the seriousness, the harm that they did to the victims? All of these things, have to, you have to try to measure them and then balance them. And uh, that's a very uh, difficult uh, process for me and I think for most judges. And then the final um, aspect as it relates to the difficulty uh, of that uh, whole process is um, you, and you learn this over time, Nobody has all good or all evil on the ledger. <laughs> um, it's just not the way human nature is. Uh, someone can do something very bad and cause a lot of harm, but in other aspects of their life, they're doing great things. Um, I often tell people, I could hand you 50 letters about someone and you'd read them and, and you'd have all be filled with wonderful things about what in their family, in the community, and you would read these letters and say, I wanna meet this person, this wonderful person. And I would say to you, well, that person you know, is in jail serving 10 years for robbery, armed robbery. And I think people would be shocked. They would be shocked. How can that be? Uh, but as a judge, you see that constantly. Um, and so uh, again, you're trying to weigh all those things. You're trying to look at the person's whole life and not just sentence them based upon you know, what might be the worst judgment they ever made. Uh, you have to look at their motivations um, and all the circumstances uh, surround, surrounding it. So that's why I find it so difficult. Um, you struggle with it. Sometimes on the car ride home, I'm thinking about whether the sentence was too high or too low, but you do your best to make sure you're uh, considering all the information. You're taking, you read every letter. You're considering it as seriously and, and genuinely as you possibly can. Um, and you do the best that you can on, under all the information that you have. Um, in terms of um, why this is more important, I guess, more globally, um, or as a nation, um, and many of you probably know this, uh, you know, the United States has uh, the incar highest incarceration rate in the world, I think, I looked up the numbers earlier today, I think it's over 2 million people in jail in the United States with, you know, 1800 state prisons, over 100 federal prisons, thousands of local prisons. So I think the responsibility falls on everyone, judges, lawyers, legislatures, you know, uh, and the community to look at that, to look at that, look at our sentencing policy, look at our sentencing procedure to make sure that our criminal justice system and sentencing in particular, that it's fair, that it's just, and that it's equally applied and to make changes where changes, where, where there needs to be reform we should consider what we're doing, whether it makes sense and whether we can do it better. And that's a really important part of the law and it's certainly an important part of sentencing. And you're gonna hear about that uh, today, I think from more than one uh, speaker. Um, before I, I go to our first speaker, I just wanna give you, and many of you may know some of this, some of you may be lawyers yourselves, but I just wanna give like three minutes on the law of sentencing. <laughs> Um, I do this in a whole semester at St. John's, but I think I can do it in three minutes for our purposes today. Um, for, for purposes of sentencing procedure, and I'm talking about uh, the federal level, although there are many similarities um, in terms of procedure, um, but whether you're convicted by guilty plea or by trial, um, once you're found guilty, a judge will set a sentencing date, usually about four months out, and then a pre-sentence report will be prepared by the probation department. And you'll hear from Robert Capers, the head of probation, who will explain that process to you. That's trying to give as much information about this person that the judge could possibly have before he or she uh, sentences them. Um, in addition to that report, both sides can put in written submissions of whatever they want. 
um, letters, uh, you know, medical records, whatever they think would be something they would want the judge to know about uh, from the prosecutor's standpoint, the victims or the crime, they would submit and the defendant would obviously submit whatever mitigating information he or she had. Um, at the sentencing itself, um, and I think this is a very good example of uh, procedural justice. I think it's sort of manifests itself uh, in a very pronounced way at sentencing. Everybody gets a chance to speak at the sentencing. The law requires it and um, the prosecutor will speak under the Victims' Rights Act. The victims have a right to speak. Defense counsel has the right to speak and the defendant also has a right to address the court. Even if the defendant writes a letter to the court in advance, which he or she might sometimes do, they also had the right to speak orally at the uh, sentencing itself. Um, and once everybody has spoken, the judge pronounces the sentence. Um, the judge is required to give some reasons, both orally and in writing for that sentence so that it can be evaluated both by the public and by the appellate court if there is an appeal. Um, and uh, so that, that's the procedural part of it. In terms of uh, the substantive law of sentencing, and this is a, uh, I don't know how much we'll get into this today, um, but um, there's a big variation between New York state and federal law in terms of the, the, I guess, the substance of sentencing under state law and the practice of sentencing. Um, the judges are highly involved in the plea negotiations and uh, you know, sentence, everyone sort of knows going to the sentencing what the result is gonna be. The judge has sort of signed off on it. And so there's not a lot of, I guess, drama in that respect usually at state sentences. Federal sentencing are the exact opposite. The judge is involved in plea negotiations. It's not allowed to be involved in plea negotiations. And so at the time of sentencing, there are many sentencings that I have where, especially with cooperating defendants, where he, he could walk out of this courtroom with instant freedom, where I could say time served, where I could give him 10 or 15 years or anything in between, and all that would be okay on appeal is within my uh, discretion. Uh, so that's how broad the discretion is of a federal judge at sentencing. Um, but uh, the law does require the court to consider a bunch, um, a whole series of factors in, in a statute called Section 3553A. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the factors with you, but uh, you can probably you know, predict what they would be. They're very broad. Uh, the nature and the circumstances of the offense, uh, the history and characteristics of the defendant, good or bad, the need to protect the community, the need to afford adequate deterrence to criminal conduct, uh, the need to make sure that there's not sentencing disparity among other similarly situated defendants who've done the same crime. So the law requires a judge to consider those factors, but uh, both the Supreme Court and the appellate courts have emphasized uh, what weight to give those factors, how to prioritize those factors in any particular case is completely up to the judge. Um, so you retain that discretion, even though you do have a framework that you're supposed to uh, analyze it in. And then the last thing I'll mention um, is there something called the sentencing guidelines that were created in the 1980s? Um, and um, it's a big book. Um, there's a sentencing commission that essentially creates, uh, they're almost like mathematical formulas for certain crimes and, and tries to measure them with a score. Um, so if it was a robbery, uh, you would go to a certain guideline and it would have a, a certain number and then it would start asking you questions. Uh, was a weapon used? Was anyone injured? How much was, money was taken? Was anyone tied up? And based upon those, the score can go up. Um, it could also go down under certain circumstances. And then it takes your criminal history and gives a score for that. You put those together and then it gives a range um, within which you could be sentenced. They used to be mandatory, those guidelines. Uh, the Supreme Court over a decade ago in a case called Booker said there can't be mandatory, they can only be advisory. And so now we get that number and it might be, you know, it could say 10 to 14 years, it's in months, but uh, 10 to 14, some of the ranges are very broad, broad. 30 to life can be a range. Um, and those are helpful. They're, they're starting points for a judge, but it's ultimately up to the judge um, as to how to weigh those as well. Um, there's a question about how did, how did they come up with these sentencing score guidelines? It's over time, there's a sentencing commission and um, they change over time, um, but there's, a, there's an entire process for trying to do that. But uh, I think everybody understands you can't reduce people to mathematical formulas like that, but um, I find them helpful in at least giving me some idea as a starting point of where the sentence might ultimately end up. Um, I know that was quick, but <laughs> I'll leave it at that and maybe we'll cover some of those uh, aspects of procedure and law as we go through each speaker. But I'm gonna to move to the uh, first speaker,
we have uh, Nicole Bachman, who um, I'll give you the brief brief, brief background. Uh, I, I like to give schools because you're teachers, right? You like to hear what schools we went to. And I saw someone with a University of Michigan sweatshirt. So I think you'll really like the fact that Nicole Bachman went to University of Michigan undergrad, Catholic University Law School. She was an ADA for seven years, uh, an assistant district attorney, prosecuting among other things, homicide, rape cases, robbery cases. In 2004, she became a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of New York. And for over a decade now, she has been the chief of the Long Island Criminal Division of the US Attorney's Office. So for any federal crimes on Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk County, she's the chief on Long Island that would supervise all of those cases. So she has vast experience as a prosecutor, both at the state and the federal level, and we're really delighted to, to have her. Um, so Nicole? Yes. Hi, thanks hi. for joining us. Um, I thought I would ask you to just start with something that the teachers may not be familiar with, and most of the public is not, but in our system, people think the judge is in charge of the sentencing. It's the judge who decides the, what the sentence should be, and as I described, you know, that's true to a large extent, and we have a lot of discretion to do that. What people don't understand is how, what the role of the prosecutor is in potentially controlling that sentence of either making sure the sentence is not too low or the sentence is not too high if you're trying to reach a plea deal with a defendant and the defendant is like, I don't want to plead because I'm worried the judge might give me too many years. So how are prosecutors able to essentially take power away from the judge and try to control uh, to some extent or to a large extent what the ultimate sentence might be? Yeah, so as you said, ultimately it will be up to the judge, but a prosecutor through their charging decision and also their plea decision in terms of what crime they have a particular defendant plead guilty to. So there may be certain offenses. Um, if you look to the white collar context where we could plead a defendant out to a particular offense that would cap him statutorily at five years in jail. And those sentencing guidelines that Judge Bianco spoke about earlier um, the guidelines may be in excess of five years, but by having him plead to the offense that has a statutory cap at five years, we're essentially uh, dictating that he can't get more than five years in prison. Conversely, we could do that with an offense that has a mandatory minimum by not allowing a defendant to plead to offense without a mandatory minimum. If we're concerned um, and a defendant is charged with more than one crime um, and one of those crimes carries the mandatory minimum, we could only offer a plea agreement where that mandatory minimum is in, in effect and thereby sort of dictating that the court can't go below a particular number. Let me just give an example of the, the, that type of mandatory minimum. I'm gonna use the most extreme example, but it's, it's not that uncommon. In a gang case, if it's a murder that's part of a gang under federal law, that is a statute that if you're convicted of that carries a mandatory life sentence where you cannot get parole. There's no parole in the federal system. So if you're 19 years old and you're convicted of a murder in aid of a gang, you will serve the rest of your life in jail if you live to be 90, right? Um, so the prosecutors decide whether or not to take that off the table and allow a defendant to plead to something less than that or to insist to say, uh, we're not coming off of that and the defendant uh, essentially then go to trial, uh, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's absolutely, uh, certainly, um, one of the things with a prosecutor where discretion is really important because you have to weigh all of the considerations in terms of what the actual criminal conduct is. Is this a type of offense where we should require a plea to mandatory life or should we look at other alternatives? All right, and uh, Judge Gleason is gonna talk a little bit more about mandatory minimums uh, later, but there, there are mandatory minimums for drugs, for guns, for child pornography. There's a lot of mandatory minimums that allow prosecutors to operate in, with that the discretion. Um, and it can frustrate judge. I'll just say this from a judge's standpoint, then you lose control. You may think there are a lot of mitigating circumstances that would warrant a much lower sentence and you, you just can't do it. Um, so um, I did want you to focus briefly on cooperation because again, I think this is something most people who are not part of the system wouldn't completely understand. But often it's said that to the way you can uh, get the lowest possible federal sentence is by cooperating with the government. So can you just take a minute just to explain how that would work? If someone, if you were interested in having someone cooperate in a gang case, for example, um, and, and what you would require and what they would get out of it. So for cooperating defendants, um, what happens there is if something like a mandatory minimum is in, is in play, 
as Judge Bianco was talking about, if the individual cooperates and provides substantial assistance, that may be anything from doing wiring up and recording uh, a transaction, a drug transaction or a gang meeting. It could mean that you're actually going into open court and testifying and giving testimony about the nature of a criminal enterprise like the Bloods or the Crips or MS-13 and testifying in, in open court. If you give that type of assistance uh, to the federal government, that's going to enable prosecutors to write what we call a 5K letter. And that will give Judge Bianco or whatever judge is sentencing that particular defendant the authority not only to go below any mandatory minimum if there is one, but also those sentencing guidelines that he spoke about. Those really set a, a baseline for the judge. And by cooperating, um, you're, it's telling the court that they are permitted um, or should consider going underneath that guideline sentence. So um, it's, it's a huge tool. It does entail for a defendant in the federal system to tell us every single thing he's did. So let's say a defendant is charged with a particular shooting. I've had cooperating defendants that have come in on gang cases charged with one or two shootings. And by the end of their cooperation, they've admitted to 40 shootings that they've participated in. They've maybe admitted to murders that they were never charged with. Um, that we're able to solve. So on one end, um, there is this risk to the defendant and that in order to do this, they have to disclose to the government everything they've done. But in turn, um, and in providing that cooperation to allow us to charge and potentially convict other defendants, they're enabling themselves to get a lower sentence by virtue of their cooperation. Yeah, and I just wanna emphasize when I mentioned the, the scenario where a defendant comes to court and he could get instant freedom or 10 or 15 years in jail, that's. Uh, those situations are, are very common with a cooperating defendant because the government puts the letter in, the mandatory minimums, if they exist, are gone. But ultimately, the judge decides how much weight to give that cooperation versus what their crimes were. And, um, you know, there's again, there's no formula for that. Uh, you know, some people think, oh, the judge will cut it in half or he'll give you a third or she'll give you a third. But it doesn't really uh, work like that. But the bottom line is, I think the consensus is, and it's borne out by statistics, that defendants who do cooperate end up with substantially reduced sentences. Um, now, a lot of times the government's not interested in a person's cooperation. Um, sometimes they're cooperating a very culpable person who can give them a lot of information and people will scratch their head like, why is the shooter getting the benefit of cooperation and not you know, the driver in some shooting? But they make those determinations of who they need for whatever purposes. And again, the judge is not involved in those types of uh, decisions. Um, I did want you to talk, uh, Nicole, also just about sentencing in general. Um, I think our audience would be curious how a prosecutor approaches sentencing. Uh, we're gonna look at it from the defendant's standpoint in a moment, but how do you decide what you're gonna say at sentencing, what you're gonna ask for? I think some people may think a prosecutor may go in and you know put the, the, the most uh, aggressive position for the prosecution to, to quote unquote represent the prosecution in that case. But how do you decide what you're going to say or not say at a particular sentencing? Yeah, so that's a particular challenge for a prosecutor. And I, I would definitely say that we do not go in and always recommend the maximum or the maximum guideline sentence. Every case is really looked at individually. And what I think is particularly challenging is not unlike the court, we're also balancing a number of different interests. If it's a violent crime scenario, you may have a victim's family that very much wants an individual to spend the rest of their life in prison. Um, and you may, as a prosecutor and having weighed everything that comes into effect, the defendant's background, um, perhaps the remorse he's shown, feel that recommending a lower number is important. You may have a defendant um, that has stolen a ton of money but made a lot of efforts uh, to pay that restitution back in, uh, in, in advance of sentencing. So I think we also are looking at all of the different factors and we're really trying to decide what we think is appropriate and just is going to protect the society is the actual right result. And we're really trying to figure out what's important to highlight to the court. Um, as a prosecutor, you've often lived with the case longer than anyone else. Um, you may have been there from the inception of the investigation and determining really what points to really highlight to the court and to emphasize in coming up with what that right and correct number is um, can be as much of a challenge for us, for us as it is for anyone. Because again, there's no magic formula. Um, we don't have a system where it's like, we're always gonna recommend the maximum in this or the minimum in that. 
Um, and we really have to look at each case and each de defendant individually and decide what we think is the right and just thing to do. Um, do you always ask for a particular number or it depend on the situation? Every, every case is different. So even if you were to take every murder case or every drug case, we don't treat every single case differently. Every case, uh, the facts are looked at are differently, the circumstances, the individual's role in the offense, um, what they did after the offense, um, all of those factors go into a particular case and our decision, uh, what that particular defendant's backgrounds are, what the reason for the crime is, what the victim's viewpoints are on the particular sentence. We're gonna look at all of those factors to come up with what we think is the right number to recommend. And if, are there situations, let's say you look at a defendant, a defendant put guilty in a drug case to distributing a kilo of cocaine, um, but he has a lot of mitigating circumstances, he has no criminal history, uh, he has family circumstances, health circumstances, whatever those mitigating circumstances might be. And you know the, the lawyer is going to be asking for no jail time or relatively low jail time. What discretion you have as a prosecutor to, uh, if you think there are some mitigating circumstances, um, how would you, how would that manifest itself at the sentencing? What would you do when I say, Ms. Bachman, what do you have to say? The defense lawyer gets up and says, Judge, we want you to be as lenient as possible for these 10 reasons. What do you do in that scenario? If we really believe that what the defense is recommending is appropriate, there's absolutely no reason for us not to recommend that same that same sentence as what the defense is doing. So if we think it's an appropriate sentence, we're not barred in any way um, for advocating for that same sentence. By and large, we always start with the number that, that the guidelines come up with, the, the sort of formula that Judge Bianco started with. We always start with that's the right number to begin with. And then if we're gonna go lower than that or higher than that, we wanna be able to justify why we're doing that, um, why we're departing from this number that the Sentencing Commission has come up with. But we're certainly permitted if we think it's appropriate to go under that number or over that number to do so. And we really have to look at all of the relevant circumstances and facts surrounding a particular case. Thank you. I just wanna emphasize that last point because as a judge, I could tell you prosecutor because I'm in and out of those courtroom doors and they do various, vastly different things at the sentencing. Sometimes they're arguing very strongly for a particularly high sentence and other times they come in and the defendant makes a very compelling uh, argument for a low sentence and I'll ask the prosecutor and they'll say, um, we, we, have, we, we rely on your discretion, we take no position. And they're basically signaling to me just by that alone that, you know, uh, they're not particularly concerned about what the defendant is asking for. So the whole dynamics of a sentence can change based upon how the prosecutor approaches it and what they say, or in some instances, don't say. All right, thank you very much, Nicole. We're going to now hear from the other uh, other side, from uh, the defense lawyer standpoint. We have Deirdre von Dornham. Uh, her brief background is she has a uh, master's in classics from Princeton University. And went to Columbia Law School like I did, although we didn't know each other there. And um, she then, uh, I call it the triple crown. She was a law clerk, which is a, which is a very prestigious thing to do for Judge Brody in the Eastern District uh, of Pennsylvania at the district court level, Judge Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and then had the privilege to clerk for the legendary Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, she has spent most of her career at uh, Federal Defenders in the Eastern District of New York, I think almost two decades now. Um, first as a, as a, as a, you know, a, a frontline uh, federal defender and for the last several years, she is the attorney in charge of the Federal Defenders in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, she also has been a professor and an assistant dean at NYU Law School uh, along the way. And she certainly has a lot, a lot of experience in the area of sentencing. So Deirdre, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, uh, before you talk about uh, sentencing in particular, I was just going to ask you to talk about how you approach as a defense lawyer generally representing your client. I think there is a perception among students, about the public, that a defense lawyer is trying to get an acquittal uh, for the client. That's their job, to get an acquittal. And we know that that's not the reality in many, many cases. Sometimes that's the reality, but in many other cases, the, the defense lawyer's job becomes much different. So how do you approach representation? Sure. I mean, I would love to have an acquittal in every case. So don't, <laughs> that's definitely my goal, but it's hardly ever possible in the federal system um, because the case agents, the police, everybody has done a lot of work before we ever get a case. Um, as public defenders, it's very different from private or retained counsel. We come to court and we're appointed to represent 
whoever is arrested that day. We don't choose our clients and they don't choose us. Um, and so the first obligation we have is to earn the client's trust and make sure they know that we are fighting for them and only for them. And unlike, you know, when the judge comes out and everybody immediately recognizes his authority or when Nicole comes out and they're like, oh, here's the government, you know, we're just kind of there in the corner, <laughs> you know, the public defender who you've seen on Law and Order. Um, and as with everything else in life, people genuinely and rationally believe that you get what you pay for. So, you know, there's often, and if you, you know, any movie you've ever seen, the public defender is always the schlump. Um, so, you know, my first job is to make clear that I'm going to fight super hard and that although the courts are paying me, which is another stumbling block for a lot of people in trusting us, um, although the courts are paying for me, that the only person I care about is the client. So I try to do that through body language, through what I say to them from the start, to being very explicit about, you know, you are my concern. And usually on the first day, getting you out on bail is my concern, um, making sure you go home today. Um, unfortunately, that's not always possible either, but we have a pretty high success rate in Brooklyn. Um, so that initial meeting is very important and that initial relationship forming. Um, and I, when I first took the job, you know, you just heard the judge say my resume. So probably you're assuming my classics degree was not helping me um, know how to make people trust me, let alone people charged with very serious federal crimes. And I still remember my first ever client meeting on my first day of work with no training, where I walked in, it was going over a gun case with someone and, you know, giving a very erudite discussion of the statute and the guy was like am i going home and i was like oh right <laughs> like he doesn't care like, the niceties of the statute like focus on what he needs which is i'm here for you here's how we're going to get you home um so that's always been what i cared about most and i've found it really liberating because all the credentials the judge just talked about my clients don't care about at all that is not meaningful to them. And in fact, if they hear them, they're like, are you sure? Because otherwise she'd be making a lot more money. So the only thing they care about is what I do for them. Um, and that's really kind of awesome because it really sets you free from you know all the expectation and gold stars. Um, but it's also a big responsibility. Um, and as the judge says, particularly in the federal system, um, because as you heard Nicole say, there's some controlling of sentences by the prosecutors before we even get there, which means we're in a very reactive posture. In almost all cases, there's been a big investigation before we ever meet the client search warrants, wiretaps, you know, surveillance. So we're coming in, you know, and kind of trying to get the phoenix from the ashes. Um, and, you know, the client, one part that's hard about it is that in the federal system, you don't know what your sentence will be when you plead guilty. So in state court, as the judge said, um, the judge is involved in negotiations and nobody admits to having done anything unless they're told, okay, it'll be two to four years or you know, the maximum you could get is five. Here, we're like, okay, tell them you did it and you'll get somewhere between zero and 20 years. It's a great deal. And I mean, no, again, no rational person thinks that's a great deal. And, you know, people will often say, like, are you sure? Like, what do you mean? And then you go in for your guilty plea and Judge Bianco is like, in fact, you're pleading guilty to two drug charges. So I could run them consecutive and you could get 40 years. Your lawyer didn't tell you anything different, did she? And the poor client is like, what is happening right now? How is this possible? So developing that relationship of trust long before a trial or a guilty plea, let alone a sentencing comes, is very important. Um, and obviously you can't promise a client anything. You can't say, here's the amount you'll get. You can say, here's what I know, you know, based on my experience. Um, but even that can be very difficult, even harder when Judge Gleason who's on and he'll talk to you, the end was a judge, because he would say to the person, don't plead guilty, you have a great lawyer, she'll get you acquitted. And I'm like, does this guy not think there's a reason I'm telling this person to plead guilty? 
And then the client second guesses you even more. Um, but I'm sure he was trying to help. If I could ask you, Deirdre, um, that was great. But um, I'd also like you to focus, as Nicole did, about how you approach sentencing, you and your client, I guess, together, um, after he or she has pled guilty or been convicted, whatever, uh, by trial. Um, what do you do in advance of the sentencing in terms of a written submission? Um, and then we'll talk about how you, uh, what you do at the actual sentencing day. Sure. Um, and just to start with hearkening back to what Judge Bianco was saying about how emotional sentencing is. When I was a law clerk, I cried at almost every sentencing and the judge often had to ask me to leave, including when people got probation, because it just felt so overwhelming to me this like sitting in judgment on another person and watching their families and seeing the effect on them. So I've tried hard over the years <laughs> to curb that impulse, but the whole process of it and of trying to narrate someone else's life and speak on their behalf to the court. Um, and as the judge said, trying to encapsulate the bad and the good um, and be candid is a very challenging job. So I try, you know, to start preparing for the sentencing basically from the first day I meet the person to be paying a lot of attention to everything about them, their family, getting education records, getting mental health records, um, spending a lot of time talking to relatives and close family members um, and being attentive to how, you know, for clients both who are detained who are at liberty, how they can make their sentencing better from the day they're arrested. So like I had a guy that was arrested January 1st, uh, 2020. And he had a long record, but hadn't been in trouble for a while. And I said to him, okay, I'm gonna get you out on bail, but you gotta turn it around so that you never go back in. And he's one of the few people I've had who really has followed my advice. He got a great job. He has had a, like a moment of trouble. And he's like, how am I doing? Am I working down? Will I not go to jail? Um, and, you know, people can do a lot for themselves with our support. So to me, the sentencing really starts by like helping people get in counseling, helping people get employment, because the judge is going to look at all of that. And it's one of the reasons why being detained really increases people's sentences. And there's a lot of studies on this, that people who, you know, don't get bail end up with higher sentences than people who were out on bail. Um, and a lot of that is because you can't, you know, there's not in the federal system and pretrial facilities, there's not jobs, there's not much in the way of programs. So you can't show the judge you've changed. So anyway, I try to take a very holistic approach. Um, and we have great social workers and paralegals. So we try to start, you know, ticking down, I start with the guidelines and say, okay, you're 48 months right now, let's get you down to zero months by the day of your sentencing because my hope is always if someone's being sentenced that they can get time served or probation. Uh, and then for the written submission, I mean, we usually do written submissions in every single case. Um, some defense lawyers don't, we tend to in every case, even if there's a plea agreement with the government. Um, and part of that is the law, um, although the law is not usually our best argument. Um, and a lot of that is humanizing the client for the judge who may only have seen the defendant once or twice um, and during COVID, not at all. So it's really important to have that person, you know, be alive for the judge before the day of sentencing. I, if I could ask you, Deirdre, in the few minutes we have left, and I know you're going to stick with us when we speak to Larry Williams in a moment, but um, I didn't mention to the uh, audience, Deirdre has been involved in, in representing uh, Mr. Sarnev was convicted of the Boston bombing, sentenced to death, and Deirdre uh, was not involved in the trial, but she was involved in the appeal before the First Circuit, where a few months ago, they reversed the uh, death penalty portion of the conviction, and she's now awaiting to see if that's going to go before the Supreme Court. Um, can you just speak a minute? I know you could go on at length about that representation, but I think we haven't really focused on conditions of confinement in jails, and if you could speak a little bit about uh, Mr. Sarnet's particular con conditions of confinement, and just uh, very briefly about overall where, where that case stands. Sure, and this does tie into sentencing because um, if the government seeks the death penalty again in his case, then there'll be a full resentencing proceeding, and they'll try to push for death and we'll try to push for life. If they don't pursue resentencing, then he'll automatically get a life sentence. Um, 
but as many of you probably remember, he's quite young. Um, he was 19 at the time of the marathon bombing. Um, and he had never before been in jail, not for a day, never been arrested, nothing. Um, and he's now been in solitary confinement in the Supermax facility, which is the most stringent federal facility um, in the country um, for the last four years. In Florence, so, in Florence Colorado? In Florence, Colorado, where nothing is nearby. <laughs> um, there's like groundhogs everywhere. Um, but so he's in a cement box. It's not a cell like you see in jail with the bars. There's, he can't communicate with anyone. Um, and he's under what are called SAMs, which are special security measures put in place by the attorney general. Um, and the attorney general was concerned not about what Mr. Sarnayev might say to anyone, but about what others might make um, of his words that they would you know, use his words as propaganda. So he's only allowed to speak to me and to one family member um, ever. So he goes, you know, days, weeks without talking to anybody with no, there's no outside light. There's no sensory sensation at all. Um, and again, he's not someone who had any experience of this. Um, he's limited in what books he can get. He's very limited. You know, he can't send anything out other than letters to me. Um, so it's a quite extreme case and a lot of people who are held in the supermax develop mental health problems. Um, and so it's definitely something we keep an eye on. I talk to him once a week um, for an hour, um, which, you know, is a, is a great privilege, but also very emotionally upsetting for me um, to only have that much contact. Um, so if he's resentenced, we'll go back to Boston and do it, but hopefully he won't be resentenced. But even then, you know, the great thing we will have struggled for with our hundreds of pages of briefs and years of work is he'll be in that box for the rest of his life, which is probably another 60 years. Um, and it's an unusual case in that regard because the government did not contend that he was a future danger. I know the judge mentioned obviously that in sentencing, especially in a sentencing like this, that's the biggest concern. Is this someone who will hurt other people in the future? And there's very few people on federal death row who are not considered a future danger because that's why they got the death penalty. But in his case, the government said they didn't believe he'd ever do anything again. He just should get death for vengeance. And they were very clear about that. Um, so it's a super difficult case, um, but we're just keeping on you know, fighting every part of it. If you were presenting his position to a jury in a death penalty case, what, in, in, in a few sentences, what would you say in terms of why he shouldn't get the death, other than the issue of future dangerousness, what, what, what would you point to? Um, that he did it entirely under the influence of his older brother who had an extreme history of violence and was very wedded to a terrorist ideology. Whereas Jahar, who was seven years younger, had no history of violence whatsoever and no particular interest in ISIS or even in Islam um, and was very much brought into it by his older brother who had committed a triple homicide, including of his own best friend the year before and had told uh, Jahar a lot about that and kind of beat it into him. Um, so, you know, he did it under direct duress and coercion and there's no indication from anything else in his life that he would have done it were it not for his brother. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I asked you that, I think it's important for uh, the audience to understand, there's always arguments that are worked. Some might make it's the Boston bombing. Obviously there's a lot of death and harm that was caused by right. that crime, but the lawyer can always find mitigating things to present, right? Yeah. Sometimes you have to look hard, <laughs> do a lot of investigation. <laughs> This one oddly is one of the worst crimes I've been involved with, but there's the most mitigation. All right, thank you very much, Deirdre, and I, I'm hoping you'll stick with us. Uh, of course, um, yeah, and, I have uh, you here, Judge Gleason. <laughs> we have Larry Williams. Uh, Larry, you there? Hello, how you doing? Hi, Larry, it's good to see you again. I wanna thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, and um, the big challenge with Larry, uh, Last time I spoke to him, I think we spoke for an hour, so it's going to be hard to fit it into a 15-minute slot. But um, Larry, we're, we're so happy to have you here, and uh, I think the audience hopefully will understand from the 15 minutes what an inspirational story you have of, of survival and of rehabilitation and redemption. Uh, so Larry uh, experienced 
the, the sentencing system from uh, a, a unique perspective from the other speakers here. He was charged with a crime, was convicted of a crime, and uh, was sentenced on that crime. So, uh, Larry, if you could just take a minute before we get to to the time you spent in jail and, and the story. Uh, can you just tell, tell us briefly um, how you got involved in the criminal activity? I think uh, that would be a good background, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, I grew up in the projects, uh, humble beginnings, it, it was poverty stricken and, you know, pretty much the only way to survive was the thought or the understanding is, is, is that route, um, which, is, which is selling drugs. Um, you know, uh, as a kid at five, I saw my first body um, and, you know, from there, it just kept seeing violence, drug selling and um, seeing some of the fruits of that labor. So um, eventually I got hooked. And um, I'm going to just ask Deirdre to briefly do this, uh, but I want to get it from your perspective, but you, you I think, have the record for the most years in jail Free trial, which I don't how many years was it total? I forgot the number. It was it was 17 years. All right. 17 years pre-trial, uh, before he was ever sentenced, which I don't think I've ever heard anything even close to that. But uh Deirdre, just a minute, can you explain? Uh, I know it's hard to do in a minute, how it's possible that Larry was pre-trial for that long a period of time. Yeah, I mean, it still seems nearly impossible to me. And when Larry's mom first told me that he'd been in a pretrial detention facility for 17 years, I really was like, okay, ma'am, yeah, you know, I'll get you some help. I'm sure that's not true. But it was absolutely true. Um, because he had a number of different prosecutors, a number of different judges, they retired, they died, and he would get shuffled from person to person. Um, it's also because and this is to Larry's credit, he kept fighting and fighting. Um, as he'll tell you, he started out charged with a capital crime, with a death penalty murder, um, which he did not commit. So he kept fighting it and fighting it. He had a trial, he got convicted, he got the conviction overturned. Um, and when his lawyer stopped fighting, he kept going. So some of it was him getting, you know, kind of lost in between judges and prosecutors, but some of it was Larry's unwillingness to say he did something that he didn't. Um, and he just filed pro se motion after pro se motion, many of which are very beautiful. I wish you guys could read them. Um, and in the end, uh, he persuaded everybody that all he had done was, you know, participate in a narcotics conspiracy. And that's what he was convicted of and finally sentenced for and walked out of there after his fight. He probably could have got out sooner, but he would have had to plead to that murder he didn't commit. So Larry, can you uh, talk about your time, that time you spent in jail and what you were doing, that odyssey I guess you were on and how you mentally uh, deal with that emotionally. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that? Yes, definitely. Um, when, I, when I was charged um, and, I, and they said that was the death penalty and I was facing the death penalty, I really couldn't believe it. Um, and on top of that, all of a sudden I became a threat to um, staff, my, myself and the others. Uh, so I got placed in special housing and special housing or the shoe is called or the box. Um, that's where you, it's 23 and one where you go out for an hour out the day um, and pretty much you're restricted to a cell or you might have, um, in, my, in my situation, many times I didn't, but you, you will have another cellmate um, in there with you through all of that. Uh, uh, so, you know, at, after fighting and fighting to get out of the um, special housing, um, I wound up on the units. Um, and it, it, you know, it took a lot of fortitude, you know, looking back at it and just hearing everybody speak. And sometimes I say, wow, I don't like, I don't know what was in me to just keep going sometimes. But, you know, I had this thing in myself you know, and, it, and, it, and, and that's kind of a big thing about what do, what do you do with a partial sentence, right? Let's say you're charged with four things and let's say I did one, right? How much um, help is involved for that? You know, because you're guilty, but you're not guilty, especially as an example of the highest crime, which was murder, right? And how do you leverage that? And how do you even get people to rally around you 
um, in that situation and say, wait, hold on, you're innocent, but you didn't do that, but you did this. Um, so it, it's dealing with that. And then, you know, the pretrial facility is, is, is very rough on many levels. And, you know, besides physically, um, mentally in a lot of regards, because, you know, the pretrial facility was supposed to be exactly what it was, was pretrial, right? And mostly you're supposed to be the trial in 70 days, right? Which is speedy trial. But, you know, the average person stays there from 18 months, two years, and then something's amazing, like my situation, which was 17 years. And it's not geared for that type of um, residing, for lack of a better word. So you, you, you're limited in your medical, you're limited in your, in your um, dental, excuse me, my, de my dental is horrible. I need implants and all kinds of stuff. That's a whole nother story. Um, even the um, psychiatric support is not there. Um, you know, they lock down, the officers treat you really bad. The fool is horrible on many different levels. It's, it's really not edible. Um, most of the time the fool was coming up on a cart you know, the officer would sit the food outside on a cart and go out there whenever they wanted to and bring it in and we would have cold meals, um, wasn't nutritional at all. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, they, they didn't handle violence properly. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, and, and you know, um, I experienced a lot of officers actually like kind of giving up because they didn't feel like their rights was being treated right. I mean, I, w I was in the, um, the vortex where there was no light, no heat, no help, you know, freezing. Um, and, and that- You guys, Terry says the vortex, there was a complete blackout for a week at the jail in Brooklyn he was at in the middle of winter. There was no light, there was no heat and they were just left there. And, you know, you start to say like, uh, they're trying to kill me. You get, you get that mindset that they're trying to kill you but then there's also a side of you that want to prove to yourself, to your family, and even, you know, to the prosecutors that you're not what they're saying you are. And what I decided to do, I, you know, I made this real switch and I said, I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to learn the law. Um, if I was asked for something like my mother, she was the one that was there by my side. So I would ask for a law book. I started a law book, you know, it might sound funny, but the first law book I had was like a NOLO book. It had a cartoon in it. I learned about Map versus Ohio. And I was like, this is where I start. And, and, and real quick, it's kind of funny. I got arrested in Atlanta. So before they brought me over, I didn't have any papers and stuff like that. So I walked into the library and, you know, I was like, I need help. And he was like, where's your paperwork? I didn't know what they was talking about. Then I looked over and I seen it said Black Laws Dictionary, right? And I literally, I said, I knew it. And I thought that they had a law for Black people. And that's how um, much I didn't know about the law. But ultimately I started studying and I became a law clerk and I just kept digging in. And I would tell myself that I know there's something in there. There's some law, it has to be, that can free me. And, you know, that kind of been my mantra. And then also I started um, educating myself. So every pilot program, every anything that they had, which was so limited, you know, I got involved. And then so much so I started creating curriculum and um, the, the people there started allowing me to teach it as an ACE course. So I taught, you know, um, alternative to drug dealing, which was one of mine's the entrepreneurship, like, you know, they show people that, you know, the hierarchy as far as, a, you know, a, you know, a, a Rico or something like that is no different than, uh, than, than a corporate structure. And in fact, I would argue that that's who it was really for, but that's for another day. Um, and, 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 you know, and that's how I was able to sustain. And that's how, you know, and my, and my mother, you know, that lady, like she did that time with me and she's the real hero in all of this. And she really um, endured a lot, you know, being ridiculed by the officers. You still come in here. And man, so it's, 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 so there's the mental part of you. And then in all of this, you got to face the time you face in the phones. There's not enough phones um, per um, person. There's not enough computers. So everybody's lobbying to try to be able to reach out to their families and get some kind of connection. And you know, the commissary, even if you say, oh, well, maybe you could do com commissary is, 
ridiculously high. So it's all these things you're lever leveraging and you're still trying to stay sane and you still got to try to fight your case. And it's just a lot. Yeah, it's like a tornado. Um, what, can you just speak uh, for a moment about sentencing day? What did I, you, you know, you finally did get sentenced uh, a couple years ago, I guess, but um, can you just talk about what that feeling is walking to court? You had served 17. What did the prosecutor ask for at the sentencing? 20, uh, I don't remember now. What, what did they ask for at the sentencing, Larry? Do you remember? Oh, um, it was a 30 year um, mandatory a maximum. It was a 30 right, year so, maximum. So I could right. get anything up to 30 years. So what was that, that like? Finally, you're getting you know, in front of the judge. You know, Again, we talked about how much discretion the judge has. What's going through your mind? What were you trying to do that day? Uh, what's going, can I say the judge name or no? Sure, sure. Okay. So one of the things, you know, um, and that's, that's cre credence to him, uh, Judge Carter, he he was new on the bench. Um, you know, I came in front of him, but you know, every time I went into court, to be honest with you, I was just trying to gauge him. I was just trying to figure out, like, are you going to be fair? Are you going to be just? Are you going to give me an opportunity? Are you going to look at all the evidence and really realize, like, hey, something's weird. Like, why is this guy still here? This is a problem. And just, you know, and look at my work because, you know, a lot of well, the understanding supposed to be is when you get meted out a sentence, this is a sentence that's supposed to have you rehabilitate, right? And so that you can go back out into society, right? You might have heard the prosecutor say as much, right? But here it is. Here I did. I think I checked all the boxes, right? So I'm saying if I checked all the boxes and, you know, me being in pretrial is like doing three days for one, um, maybe even, maybe I'm not even doing that favor because like you literally have no program. I can't walk around. I have to stay in this one. So it's like being in a hamster box, a hamster box. But Larry, um, can you see that more clearly? You guys, he didn't go outside for 17 years. There's yeah. no outside space at all because it's a pretrial facility. So he was not outside. He couldn't feel the weather, nothing for 17 years. I couldn't feel the sun on my face. I couldn't smell. I forgot how grass smelled. And, you know, so it's like yep. all these things. So, you know, and I'm always um, grasping on to my sanity in a way that I said, I know that I know you're not what they're doing. So just stay on, just fight. And, that, and, that, and you know, that's a lot. But so now I'm going to, now I'm thinking about sentencing. I'm like, should I have done it? Should I put my faith in this judge? I know he's deemed fair and, you know, I, yeah, I did it. And, you know, all these emotions, I, you, you can't sleep. Literally, if anybody tells me they slept um, before their sentencing day, probably even two days before that, you know, I would have, I would like to have a conversation because you can't sleep, you're on nerves, you can't eat. And, you know, literally somebody is going to decide how the rest of your life is. And also for me is, I didn't even know how to feel that because even when you get sentenced, you, normally you get sentenced and then you get to chart out how you do your time with, with an end date in mind. Whereas Mars was like, there's no end date, I'm just here. Um, but but I, so, so, going, so going into this situation, I mean, it was like, finally, but then it was also like, am I gonna get justice? Is this gonna be just? Um, and then I seen my family members. So I seen family members that, you know, they weren't even born. They weren't there. Um, my daughter was six months in the stomach. I mean, three months in the stomach when I went to inside. So she's now 17 and a lot of her cousins or whatever is there. So I'm just, I couldn't believe it. So my, my emotions, even though I was prepared, I tried to prepare yourself, myself but you never could really prepare for that moment. And, you know, before I knew it, I was, I was not even a, a eighth through my speech and I'm, I'm, I'm choked up. I can't even get the words out. And the moment was just, it was surreal, but it was so big. And then, you know, my, I looked back and they were crying and it was just, wow. And, you know, um, I, I accepted a role for, but not for, for the closest thing to what I did. And also realizing that me being in those situations um, ultimately 
allows um, things to occur because it could be easily, you could easily say in your mind, like if I wasn't here, maybe this wouldn't, you know, who knows? Maybe if I don't go down the street, this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. So I had to deal with that. And, and I kind of wanted to show society, my family and everyone else that I could take on some things, even if not everything was my fault, I could take on a little more just, just for the sake of, um, just for the sake of, I would like to believe, and maybe you might think this is too far fetched, but just for society, you know, I became a vegan, you know, so in a vegan, I didn't want to eat any animals. I wanted to show as much compassion as I could. You know, I, I started practicing yoga, yoga. I read about, you know, yogis and stuff like that. So I just wanted to be a better human if I could. Um, and yeah. I think it would be great to end, Larry. Uh, uh, Judge Carter did give you the time served uh, sentence. And he just talked, uh, what, when was that? How long ago was that? What was, when did you, you get out? Yeah, I got out September 2019 and oh. I was two weeks behind from getting into school and I got into school and you know, I hold, uh, yeah, I'm bragging a little bit, four point. Um, no, that's why I wanted you to tell them where, how are you doing? Yeah, we all are inspired I, by this. I, yeah, I got a 3.9 GPA. I'm in the honors program. I was, I was leveraging two schools, which was Columbia University and St. Francis. Um, but what I decided, I said, you know, um, I, it was something about being in a little school setting and how I can, you know, um, reach out to the people and that it, it felt like more love there. So I, so like after my last semester, which just passed that one, I decided that I'm going to forego the Columbia University classes, although the branding is there and all that stuff. Um, and, and I doubled down on St. Francis, you know, uh, I, I took a minor in entrepreneurship. I'm a philosophy major. Um, I, I did a ton of programs. So that's probably which one uh, everybody should know. I, I jumped into the Beyond the Bars at Columbia University. I, I taught entrepreneurship to justice impacted youth. Um, I was on plenty of panels, just, you know, getting it out there and just letting people know that, you know, there is redemption. You know, there, it, it is such things as second chances. And, you know, I also applied for um, a, a program that is, uh, is the law access program through Yale University. I, so I should start that in um, August. So they're gonna gear you up and get you in position to take your LSATs. Um, and hopefully I could get in that school or any other law school. So I could be much like, you know, um, be on the other side of it, if you will. and and you know, just add value where I can. So I'm in every program you could think of, of course. I'm in, um, as far as my school, everybody knows me because when I'm in the Zooms, I raise my hand and I, and I just want to be present. And lastly, um, you know, I feel I have a big um, thing to prove to myself, my family, you know, um, to the defense attorneys to, to show them that, yeah, you, there's people out here, yeah, we're worth it. And, and to let even the prosecution know that, you know, whether you feel everybody's, you know, criminals or bad people that, you know, sometimes it's just bad judgment in life or circumstances and, you know, people are worth a shot. And yeah, in and, 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 and closing, um, the people that I left inside, ones that I feel, me personally, they got a raw deal. I want to at least honor them by doing the right thing. And respectively, and I want to close with this is, you know, yes, there's victims. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things that's being done um, in the criminal defense part, you know, uh, especially with like Deirdre's um, crew, I'll say, um, is, 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 is the restorative justice piece. Don't underestimate it. The restorative justice piece is amazing. You know, a lot of the victims want to actually have this conversation and want to understand the whys and how to get better with this. And that's very important. And, and the last piece, uh, uh, I'll keep saying that, but I promise this is the last piece. Um, really looking at the grand jury part and dealing with the, um, the unconscious bias piece and, and trying to figure that out because, um, you know, as, as, as the way it goes, you know, in the grand jury, we don't have access. We mean in person as a defendant does not have access to be in that room to tell their side. So 
it doesn't happen to the grand jury. So just making sure that it's an even playing field and honoring what um, justice really is supposed to look like. Uh, Larry, I can't thank you enough. Uh, keep up the great work. Thank, we look forward to following your success uh, over time, continued success. And my hope, as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, session is that through this session, which we're recording, hopefully your inspirational story will get out to um, you know, students across New York City because uh, they'll never forget it if, if they're able to hear it. So thanks again. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move to Robert uh, Capers, who um, I'll briefly give his background. He went to NYU uh, undergrad at Albany Law School. Similar to Nicole, he was an ADA in, in Robert Morgenthau's office for a number of years, then became a federal prosecutor in Brooklyn and ultimately rose to be the head of that office, the US attorney in um, 2015. He spent, after he finished that tenure, a brief time in, as a partner in private practice and has returned to uh, the courts in 2019 as the chief probation officer for the Eastern District of New York. So uh, welcome, uh, Rob. And um, if you could just briefly talk, I mentioned the pre-sentence report in the beginning. Can you yeah. uh, just briefly explain to the teachers, your people are confused because the probation department prepares that report. Um, they're just confused, I think, by the by the name, but um, they prepare every port, report. Uh, can you just uh, and I think a copy of the sample one was part of the material so they can look at it and page through it. But can you just briefly describe what's in there? Sure, Judge. Uh, thank you. And I just want to say to Mr. Williams, thank you for uh, the powerful testimony. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to start by saying, uh, as a former prosecutor for most of my adult life, uh, I believe in the notion of second chances. And that's why uh, I came to the probation department as the chief probation officer because I believe that the department that I run and the people that I work with uh, are tasked with, among other things, um, you know, helping those who are deserving of a second chance uh, do their best to successfully reintegrate back into society. So that being said, uh, following up on your question, Judge, the pre-sentence report is one of the most important functions uh, that we uh, in the probation department have. Uh, the, uh, the PSR, as we call it, is the instrument or the chief instrument through which the judge uh, is able to gather all the information that he or she can have uh, and learning as much about uh, the defendant that's before them, offense conduct, et cetera, et cetera, uh, so that they could have uh, information in front of them uh, to appropriately consider what uh, the sentence uh, what the appropriate sentence should be uh, for a defendant. Uh, the difference between my job and that of a defense lawyer or a prosecutor is uh, I don't have a side that I advocate for. I advocate down the middle um, for, uh, for justice uh, and justice is determined based upon what a judge's understanding of the facts and circumstances are, uh, aggravating or mitigating factors, whatever they may be, uh, so that they could fashion a sentence. And so what our officers do in the pre-sentence division is they conduct an exhaustive investigation um, where uh, they do everything from gather up documents from and reports from the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, from defense lawyers, from the investigative agency, the agents from whatever the, the law enforcement agency is, be it DEA, uh, FBI, uh, ATF, or whomever, um, and begin to compile the offense narrative. If there has been a trial, we also uh, go through the trial transcript so we can gather uh, all the facts and circumstances of the offense. And we then, uh, the next phase of that is we interview all the parties. So we will interview um, with defense counsel present, uh, the defendant so that we could understand everything from the offense through that, that, that defendant's uh, eyes uh, to uh, uh, any and all facts and circumstances of that person's life. Uh, and we dig into everything from, from the time they were born until the present. All the good, the bad, and everything in between so that we can lay that out uh, in the pre-sentence report. Uh, and so then the pre-sentence report is broken down into different areas, uh, different parts. The first part, part A, uh, captures uh, the offense conduct um, all around. Um, any um, aggravating or mitigating factors, what role the person played in the offense, 
if the person accepted responsibility um, and anything else um, and uh, fashions um, what would be uh, the, uh, and conducts its, uh, its guideline calculation based upon the nature of the offense. I saw that in the chat that uh, Judge Gleason uh, laid out what the Sentencing Commission did in part by in fashioning this, uh, this, this horizontal and vertical grid uh, that arrives at a sentencing range. We go through that all top to bottom, uh, including the defendant's criminal history, uh, if anything that he has, um, uh, offender characteristics, anything about the offender. If one of the root causes or the triggers for the crime were circumstances like Mr. Williams. If the person is uh, addicted to drugs, has a gambling problem or anything that was a trigger for those for that offense uh, and any number of other things uh, and being able to um, arrive at, at the end of the day, a comprehensive report for the judge so the judge can uh, fashion an appropriate sentence. And I just wanna emphasize that this is often like 30 page single space document as a judge uh, that's so important to me. I, I feel like that's how I get to know the person's life from, you know, as Rob said, their childhood, uh, all the mitigating circumstances that could exist, um, in all the different categories, health, family, you know, um, substance abuse, all, all those different things can be extremely important in, in isolation or in combination. Uh, in, in the uh, last few minutes we have, Rob, if you could just talk about the supervision function, if someone gets probation or uh, we haven't mentioned supervised release, but uh, usually if a person, once their person gets released from prison, they're on supervised release about three years and they'll be supervised. So can you just talk briefly what, uh, I know people have a perception, like the probation officer is looking to, you know, for a violation to get the person back in jail, which is not, in my experience, the relationship. Uh, just talk a little bit about what probation officers do in terms of monitoring and what they do to try to help the person, you know, uh, continue to rehabilitate and, and get, uh, on their feet. Sure, so the probation function uh, over the years from the time even when I was in uh, baby AUSA till now has evolved substantially. Uh, uh, probation, you know, us being a department of second chances, uh, once a person is released on from, uh, if they were incarcerated, uh, you know, we receive a pre-release notification. Uh, and then what we do through our reentry unit is we conduct an investigation, a background investigation. We go to the location where the person under supervision is proposing to live. We look at the place, uh, the people who live there, the surrounding areas, just to make sure that it is a stable functioning environment. If the person in a previous time had gang affiliations or things like that, or ran with a crew, we wanna make sure that where they're going to uh, is not being populated by those very same people. The goal is to get this person in the right footing from the jump so that they could uh, readjust back to life on the outside and be successful. Uh, and so we have a team of officers, many of whom uh, have various specializations. We have people with MSWs, with PhDs, with certificates in various counseling. We have mental health specialists, drug treatment specialists. All of these people designed to figure out what the risks are, what the triggers are uh, that cause the, the person to offend in the first place, and try to fashion uh, a comprehensive supervision plan for that individual that will not only address those triggers, um, but also uh, give them the educational, vocational, uh, uh, emotional, mental, so psychological help that they need so that they can begin the path of readjusting back to life as a productive citizen and getting to a point where they can self-regulate and self-supervise without the need of oversight. So we have everything from more restrictive forms like location monitoring and periods of home detention in the beginning uh, to everything in between. And the goal is, is to, in some instances, depending on the offense conduct, starting with a very restrictive form of supervision and having people work their way down along the continuum as they meet certain benchmarks uh, so that we can give them the freedom that's associated with, uh, you know, uh, conducting themselves in a law-abiding uh, way. We have educational uh, 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 imperatives. We have uh, job readiness, skills uh, assessment for, uh, for those so they can develop the skills uh, to be self-sufficient. Drug treatment, mental health treatment, all of those various all of those services things. as well, right? Yes, absolutely. We have, we have officers who are specialists um, who 
uh, will uh, fashion plans where they have them in drug treatment programs, if it's drug treatment, if it's mental health, we have people who uh, need to be medicated and need to be on programs where they are, we ensure that they are medicated and getting the counseling services and the treatment services that we need. So we have treatment service specialists um, who, who perform those functions. Now, these folks are law enforcement officers. And if there's a moment in the supervision points where a person is offending and reoffending, and we have to file a violation, uh, bring that before the court, ultimately have that person uh, incarcerated for a period of time or put enhanced restrictions on them, we will. But the goal is uh, addressing the triggers first, getting folks ready first to be uh, successful, uh, and then um, you know, a law enforcement function on the back end if we need to, because at the end of the day, we are enforcing the court's orders regarding the terms of supervision and standard conditions or special conditions that the judge imposes on a person under supervision based upon their individual uh, characteristics as laid out in the PSR that we talked about on the front end. So the PSR on the pre-sentence side begins what we hope to be the 360 process, 360 degree process towards rehabilitation uh, and readiness for a productive life. Uh, once we get past uh, the offense of con the, the conviction and whatever sentence is imposed. Great. Thanks so much, Robin. I see there's a question. Uh, I'm just going to give a real quick response to it. Uh, if there's a factual dispute regarding what's in the report, what due process protections you have? There is a process It's called a FATICO hearing. If you object to a fact, you're entitled to a hearing. Uh, it's not like a trial. You, you know, you can use hearsay. So it has some due process protections, but not at the level of a trial, but there is a whole procedure for those types of uh, disputes. But uh, thanks again, Rob. I really appreciate your, your words. Um, okay, we're going to move to Judge Gleason. He's batting cleanup today. I could eat up his 15 minutes just with his accomplishments, but I'm going to do it in 30 seconds. Um, he uh, went to Georgetown undergrad, University of Virginia Law School, spent many years as a federal prosecutor in uh, Brooklyn. He was the lead prosecutor in the uh, successful conviction of John Gotti. He was appointed to the bench, um, the federal bench, as a district court judge in Brooklyn, served for 22 years in that capacity. And I will point out for purposes of today's discussion, um, what is, has been a trailblazer in sentencing reform. Judge Gleason was talking about sentencing reform long before anybody else. He helped found a number of alternative to incarceration programs in Brooklyn um, that have now become a model for courts uh, throughout the country. Uh, I find all his work uh, extremely inspirational. Um, and now uh, uh, in 2016, he became a partner at Devil Voice in Plimpton, where he now uh, works, but uh, that has allowed him uh, to really uh, do sentencing reform from the outside. As a judge, you have certain constraints on what you can do as a matter of policy, um, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that he'll talk about what his efforts have been uh, since he's left the bench to help advance sentencing reform. So, uh, Judge Leeson. Uh, thank you, Judge Joe. You know, he used to be my little brother on the bench in Brooklyn. <laughs> Now I'm back among the unwashed and he's been elevated to the Court of Appeals. So I have to treat him like the special- uh, I'm still your little brother. <laughs> thank you, Joe. <laughs> um, look, I'm, thank you for having me. It's a great thing that the circuit is doing. Thank you, Larry and Deirdre and Rob and, and all of our participants, Nicole. Um, it's a really good thing you're doing uh, to assist uh, the, our, our audience. Um, look, I've been a, I'm a part of the system. I was a prosecutor for 10 years and a judge for 22. And now I'm, I'm out doing litigation, but I'm doing criminal defense as well. So I've, for five years, and I, I feel like I know I'm a part of the system. Uh, I've had every role in the system except the one Larry has. Larry, thank you so much for, for providing that perspective. Um, it's so important. I was taught by one of my mentors to visit a prison every year, and I did um, while I was on the bench. So I could, I was told, you go, don't forget, don't forget the defendants you sentence after they go through the marshal's uh, uh, cell block door, go and see where they go after you sentence them. Because 
Look, and I, the reason I say I'm part of the system is so I, I, I can say not as an outsider, as an insider, it's my system too. But make no mistake about it, it is uniquely punitive, uh, uniquely all good criminal justice systems need to be introspective and look for defects. And we got a lot of them. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. We criminalize more conduct than any country that we consider similar to ours. We incarcerate people for much longer than they do in circumstances that strip them of their dignity in ways that don't need to. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Vera Institute of Justice, and we bring corrections leaders from, this, from around the country to places like Germany where people in prison dress like this and they can go out to a job and then come back. It doesn't have to be the way it is. And, you know, look, Larry, you know, he said he saw Black's Law Dictionary and made it, you know, said he thought that was the law for Blacks. And unfortunately, he's closer to the truth to the truth than he imagined. You know, we, for years, we punished crack cocaine, for, you know, one gram of crack cocaine, the same way we punished 100 grams of powder cocaine. And then we figured out that was there was no basis for that. And it was shamelessly, shamefully, racially discriminatory. And it took us a quarter century to fix it. And we didn't fix it all the way. We still do it. But now we do it to an 18 to 1 ratio. I've spent the last couple of years trying to ameliorate the effects on individuals of a sentencing enhancement. You know, when you commit a robbery with a gun, a prosecutor has two choices. It can prosecute you for the robbery and then increase your offense level by a couple of levels because you had a gun. Or it can bring a separate charge that gets you a mandatory consecutive 25 years for that gun. And whereas 46% of the eligible population for the hard, for the, for the 25 year option are black men, the ones who get the 25 year option back to back these uh, and mandatory uh, enhanced sentences are 70% black. So, you know, it's not, uh, it, might, it might be implicit and uh, unintended. It might just be a discriminatory impact, but we, we have a race problem throughout our society. We have one in criminal justice to a degree that is uh, no one should, to, uh, should underestimate. So, you know, if you want to look from your perspective, you know, I love talking to teachers because, you know, there's so many facets. It seems like an overwhelming issue, criminal justice and criminal justice reform. But it's not hard to focus on, on facets of it, each one of which we could have a program of this length uh, independently. Sorry if my dog starts barking behind me, but if I didn't let him in, he'd be barking at the door now. You know, so there are mandatory minimum sentences. You've heard um, about those mandatory minimum sentences and guidelines. The regime we now have, it's about 35 years old, took sentencing discretion away from prosecutors, away from judges, excuse me, um, because it was previously unbounded and there was a decision made to guide it and, and, and restrict it. And discretion in a system that tries to individualize sentences is kind of like water. You know, it seeks its level. If you take it away from, from judges, it's going to go somewhere. And it went to the executive branch. They can charge mandatory minimums. When I began as a prosecutor in 1985, 20% of cases went to trial. For the last uh, more than a decade, fewer than 3% of cases go to trial. Because prosecutors say to someone, if you don't plead or you don't plead guilty and cooperate, you're going to face an onerous mandatory minimum sentence or an onerous guideline range based on those mandatory minimums. So we have a we've shifted as a system from an indeterminate regime in which judges were empowered to a determinate one that empowered prosecutors. In that, during that period, there's a 700% explosion in our federal prison population. Um, as I say, a diminution in the trial rate. 
from 20% to 3%, a diminution in the number of sentences that did not involve incarceration from 50% down to what it is now, 7%. And the pendulum is beginning to swing back. It's always that kind of any change that inures to the benefit of a criminal defendant always comes at a glacial pace because legislators have to run for office. And there's a sense that anything that can be characterized in a soundbite as soft on crime will get you unelected. So even when there is a consensus, and there is, everybody, most people on both sides of the aisle, for whatever reason, of the of the Democratic Republican aisle, for whatever reason, some some are driven, some are influenced by the fiscal costs of over incarceration, some by the human costs of over incarceration. For whatever reason, there there is now a consensus that we've over incarcerated. We need to decarcerate. But even when we reach a consensus, uh, it's getting change is like turning the Queen Mary around when it, the change inures to the benefit of criminal defendants. It's coming slowly. We had a, you, some of you may have read about the First Step Act. It's now two years old. That was really literally the First Step Act in reforming the results of the last sentencing reform movement. And there's a lot of work to be done. Other, just quickly, other facets, so there's mandatory minimums, there's harsh guidelines. There's an insufficient number of alternatives to incarceration. Federal system is slightly different, fewer addicts proportionally than in the state systems, but there are plenty of them. And it takes $2,500 a year to treat, but it takes $30,000 a year to incarcerate. <laughs> So thank you, Joe, for mentioning the pretrial, the drug court that we started in Brooklyn that's become a model. It's a sensible alternative to incarceration. So there's insufficient alternatives to incarceration. Rob is now firmly entrenched in the reentry space. We don't, we incarcerate for too long. There's a direct relationship between the length of incarceration and increased recidivism, not decreased. So we need to give people help to assimilate back into their communities. And that's where reentry and the reentry coordinators in the US Attorney's Office play such an important role. And lastly, long after people are finished paying their debt to society through a prison term, if one is imposed, through supervision under Rob's, in, under Rob's tutelage in the Eastern District of New York, there are collateral consequences of convictions that are inestimable. They really, you know, you can't get a job. Sometimes you can't get housing. And we need, as a society, we need to come to grips. You know, and there, it's a patchwork quilt of like senseless, uh, you know, you can't become, you can't get a barber's license in New York if you have a federal conviction. There's any number of imposed federally or state or regulations of impediments. We want people, once they've finished their criminal justice experience, to become productive members of the community, but we erect these, these uh, this mind-numbing uh, array of barriers, not just impeding the right to vote and the ones you've heard about, but ones that keep people from getting jobs and keeping jobs. So look, I love our system. I'm, a, I'm part of it. Sometimes I'm ashamed at the features of it we have now, but it always makes me determined to kind of not just beef about it, but but in a in a, like a, the lawyer that I am, describe how we got there, describe why it's wrong, and then the history that associated with how we got there is often the key to how we fix it. And there's a lot of work to be done. So why don't I just stop there, Joe? Because I know. I just, I, in, in a minute, John, I just, I, I find the work you're doing now so inspirational. Could you just describe what you're doing at Deba Voice to uh, try to address people who have gotten some of these long mandatory minimums? Could you just talk for a minute about that? Yes. The most of my typical client, and now I've got about 40 of them, um, committed uh, five or six robberies when they were 19 years old, many of them addicted. And because they had the temerity to exercise their Sixth Amendment right to trial, they were forced to face the multiple gun counts of the kinds I described, of the kind I described earlier. 
So they're doing life. It, it may be 112 years without parole, not life without parole, but they're going to die before they serve 112 years. The First Step Act opened up a path to go back before judges like Joe Bianco and for us to, to seek a sentence reduction based on what are, with the legal phrase is extraordinary and compelling circumstances. And one extraordinary and compelling circumstance is obviously the length of the sentence. Another is it's a sentence enhancement that was deployed in racially discriminatory fashion by the Department of Justice. Other extraordinary circumstances are, you know, people change. A, a kid who commits a crime at age 19, and any of you with 19 year olds know you haven't grown up. You may be an adult in the eyes of the law, but you're not an adult in any other sense, certainly not your cognitive development. So, and they've, they've grown up. Now that my, a lot of my clients who were 19 when they went in are now 45, 52, whose projected release date is in the next century. And we've gone into court over the virulent objection of the Department of Justice. I don't get that. Sometimes they don't even recognize my Department of Justice. And to seek relief, and we've, we're succeeding around the country. We've already gotten relief. We've got guys home, got about 15 guys home. And there's about 2,500 of these men who were subjected to these stacked firearm enhanced sentences. And I've uh, got a, an associate on each case, young lawyers who are doing, who are getting results for these men. And I, you know, the, the kind of results that as you can go a whole career as a lawyer and not achieve something as significant as it is to take a man like Larry, who's got a family waiting for him, who's doing an excessive sentence and getting them home. It's a very, you know, I, I, I've shared this with Deirdre. You know, I spent a lot of years putting people in prison when I was a prosecutor. It's orders of magnitude more difficult, but orders of magnitude more gratifying to get them out when they're serving excessive sentences. And that's what we're doing now. And Judge Gleason has got more people out in the last six months than our whole office. <laughs> well, you guys can you can compete against each other. That's a good competition, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank Judge Judge Gleason. Uh, despite his unbelievably busy schedule, has always uh, made himself available to speak about uh, sentencing and sentencing reform. And I, I thank him because his insights and his work are second to none. So um, thanks, Judge Gleason, and uh, thank to our, our whole All Star panel. Uh, this panel really uh, delivered in, in an amazing way. And I also just want to say to the teachers, um, it says a lot about you that you decided to enlist and be part of this program, take time out of your schedule. Um, and um, we are so hopeful that you will go back into the classrooms and really bring these issues to the, to the students. And whatever the Second Circuit can do, whatever our civics education program can do to be helpful to you, you just let us know because there's no more important work than educating our students about these critical issues. So uh, thank you uh, very much. I hope you uh, sign in for the next uh, session and uh, have a good night. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.